Hey everybody, today we are talking about biotech and we are talking about how you can use computational biology, AI machine learning methods, etc. to identify a gene that might cause a cancer or a disease, how you can then develop uh, a drug candidate which can then go in and switch that gene off uh, to test whether that can prevent that disease or that cancer. And then how you actually turn that into a drug that can help patients in a clinic through testing and clinical trials and that kind of thing. Now, my guest today is Jack O'Mara, and he's a biomedical engineer turned entrepreneur and CEO of Oka Bio. And Oka Bio are doing this in liver disease. Now, they are a very cool company doing some very cool things. They are doing every stage of that journey from using these computational methods to identify the gene all the way through to clinical trial development. And they're doing some super interesting things at that end of the scale even further. So at the minute, you might have, you might know or have heard of or understand animal testing. So you might test the drug on mice to see how it works in the mouse liver. But when you then take that into human trials, there's a huge failure rate from animal testing to the human testing. And one thing that Oka Bio are doing is they are growing human livers outside the body, so ex vivo, and they're growing these in uh, an ICU environment, so it, for all intents and purposes, an intensive care. Intensive care, obviously, there to support human organs, so it makes complete sense. Um, and they're growing these these organs, and then they are adding, or say adding, they're replacing this animal testing with testing on human livers in that environment, massively improving the qualification of those drugs uh, and how they will get through human clinical trials. Um, Jack talks about how the FDA has, has passed the, an FDA Modernization Act, I believe. Um, which is now moving to what looks like banning animal testing, which is obviously great. And it obviously increases the success of the medicine down the road. It is a bit more expensive, but with Oka and others that are pioneers of this, they're sort of proving that this is ROI positive, that people are actually going to see the economic benefits of not having to do so many animal trials that end up failing and if we can't make the drug so for pharma companies this looks like a huge advancement and and really important um but for oka they as i say are doing all of this stuff it's incredibly ambitious jack spent some time in the u.s uh spent some time learning how to commercialize healthcare innovation in the in biology innovation in the u.s went into consulting and did a few other things but obviously from biomedical engineering originally um, but comes with what we call this big scale energy. So the idea for Okabio with Jack and with Quinn, the, the co-founders of Okabio, really is this big ambition of can they change everything? Can they change this whole path? Can they go all the way through from drug discovery to uh, drug in clinic for patients? And the way Jack talks about this is epic. So yeah, hope you enjoy this one. So Jack, welcome to the Health Tech Podcast. How you doing, mate? I am doing fantastic. How are you, good sir? Excellent. I'm I'm very well. Made better by two things. Uh, the first thing is that I've got a brand new microphone, and for anybody listening, uh, I hope you can tell the difference. If you can't, keep it to yourself. But this is a this is one of those expensive uh, Shure SM7Bs for anyone that knows their podcasting, oh, knows their microphones. This is sure. the the Joe Rogan, the Lex Friedman, the, <laughs> you you name you name a podcaster, they're using my microphone. So that's making me feel well. In, in part, quite good that I'm thinking like I've got loads of quality. In part, really nervous because this is the first recording, so I don't know what it's actually going to sound like <laughs> and whether I've like majorly messed up a, a key setting. So that so that'll be interesting when I listen to this back or send it to Jack for editing but hopefully hopefully moving up in the world and the, se and the second reason i'm good is because i've just learned jack that you're wearing your pub jumper uh which is a great concept and a concept that i think i need to take forward now to have a specific pub jumper <laughs> and as we talked about just now just disappointing that we haven't done this over a pint of guinness because this has been a long time coming you and i having this chat so i'm delighted to have you here delighted to have you in your pub jumper um 
Do you want to say hi or talk to any of that for me? Yeah. <laughs> Lots to cover there. Um, I am delighted <laughs> to be here, good sir. I, uh, I didn't bring my good. fancy new microphone, which I loaded across London yesterday. And yes, this is my multi, <laughs> my very versatile jumper that fits in, in pubs, conferences, and, uh, mm. the like, and podcasts even, particularly shines in podcasts. It's might I add. It's key, isn't it? Versatility in clothing. It just, it just makes it, it makes life incredibly efficient. One less decision to make. It's one jumper that fits into everything. It's kind of ideal, right? Amen. Amen. Knitted in the hills Amen. of the West of Ireland. <laughs> well, that's where we might start the first story. So, um, yeah, Jack, the way we start these is for you to, for you to tell, tell the story. So to, yeah, give us the long version. Um, how do you get to being the CEO of, uh, Oka Bio? Where does that start? I'll go back to, <laughs> go way back to the west of Ireland. Uh, well, I, I grew up in, I grew up in, uh, in Dublin actually to the son of mm. two slightly hippie-ish parents who, uh, you know, people used to describe them as so relaxed, they're horizontal. <laughs> and growing up in that <laughs> environment, I always kind of found I was, uh, I had a lot of energy. I was sort of like a, um, what's that, uh, ad for the battery Duracell? person who just like oh, can't, yourself on it. yeah 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 um so i it was like a contrast to my extremely relaxed parents but i i had a hippie mother grown up in um in the city in dublin who when i was nine decided this city life ain't for you son we're gonna pull you out and move you to a, the countryside so she moved me into a house with a farmhouse out in the middle of rural ireland where we lived for <laughs> many years and i was I, I was pulled out of having like an inner city Dublin accent and stuck on this farm with these like very strong <laughs> rural Irish men who would put me to work, uh, like <laughs> selling the eggs that their chickens had laid and cleaning, uh, farm equipment and feeding horses and cattle in the middle of the night. So it was like quite a rapid transition. I don't know where, I, why I've gone this far the back. The classic, what... <laughs> the classic biotech founder journey. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know what relationship this has to my current role, but um, but maybe the versatility, like my like my yellow jump, pub jumper, is uh, <laughs> is a necessary attribute of a CEO. Who knows? Um, but anyway, that that was my upbringing, and then I I moved to. I was always had an aptitude for an interest in maths and biology. I was very like, very keen on how the human body works, and I had this sort of natural uh, affinity to numbers. I was quite mathematically minded. Um, so that combination sort of led me towards biomedical engineering, which in Ireland, you have to choose really early. So I was like 17. You're like list, looking through this list of courses and you don't get any flexibility. You're like, you just pick one. <laughs> it was like between marine biology, PE teaching and fucking biomedical engineering. Anyway, glad I, said, <laughs> glad I chose that one in the end as a young 17 year old. Um, and then I went out West and studied in a beautiful, very culturally rich um gaelic city by the name of galway where i played it went to a lot of music um did a lot of arts did some busking on the streets the mean streets of galway very untalented busker was i uh, and did a lot of fundraising what were you playing for, i was playing the guitar uh, i had a couple of paolo nutini couple of um oasis of tunes course. in the in the of back course. pocket <laughs> <laughs> um, I got very Again, classic biotech found of this. <laughs> you told me to go early in the warm up for this, so I'm going really <laughs> early and sort of digging up the old, the old guard. And then um, I, I was really into um, global development at the time. I did a lot of work with a group around uh, development programs, social, social development programs in Tanzania and Nepal, and raised a bunch of money. Hence the busking. Mm -hmm. Did a lot of like charitable fundraising at the time. Um, and I thought I was going to go that direction with my career post graduation and then got this scholarship opportunity to go to the US to do a, a kind of grad school focused on commercializing new healthcare innovation. Um, so I took a hard left. I remember the day I got this offer. It was like a beautiful sunny day in Galway, just finished exams, was like going out for a few pints of Guinness on the town. So excited. And I get this letter and I'm like, <gasps> I was going to go, um, do something slightly more, um, adventurous, but now being brought towards the US, towards a sort of commercial life. Anyway, I was, I was definitely right decision. I moved to the US and studied over there and went, yeah, I was very interested. I was always fascinated by 
uh, right, you got some interesting scientific innovation, you got some interesting sort of idea. How does that actually impact anyone? Like, what, how does that ultimately lead to a product that u- improves mm-hmm. the health of humankind? And what's the journey that these these sort of innovations go on? And so that that interest sort of led me from the lab because I was doing sort of an early research program on tissue engineering and trying to find new treatments for uh, tendon repair, actually. And then uh, then ended up moving to the US to study on this program that really taught you all of the ins and outs of commercializing and bringing these types of products to the market. And then from that went to work in consulting for a few years, which is a great education because you get such a broad ranging sort of range of exposures to various industries within the healthcare domain. I was doing health insurance, I was doing um, digital health, I was doing biopharmaceuticals and early stage biotech companies. And through that process, ended up at a business called Avexis, which was a very exciting company to join. I joined, it was like 80 people. By the time I left, it was well over a thousand and really scaled up quite significantly. It was really fascinating to watch that journey from the inside and sort of be a part of, see that whole sort of ship take off. And it was it was an amazing project in that, the product we were developing out of Exus was a curative treatment for uh, terminally terminal illness for that affected children, SMA it's called. And it was amazing sort of breakthrough in the gene therapy field. And to see kids come into the facility who had been treated with the product that we were all working on and have would have been had essentially been given a death sentence and now are running around like uh, healthy young children should was just this profoundly moving and inspiring sort of um journey to be on and it really shaped the trajectory of my career from generalist healthcare um, personality towards okay I really want to do advanced therapeutics I think there's just amazing profound impact that one can have in this field it's just like it's such a leveraged highly leveraged industry for a person to commit their time to because one if we were successful in our endeavor to improve liver disease you can imagine this just incredible uh, impact that you could have in a short life on this earth for so many people that are affected by that tragic condition. It's one of the third leading cause of premature death in much of the industrialized world, and there hasn't really been any success, very little success. So anyway, so then I came back to, I sort of jumped ahead there, then I came back to the UK, wanted to do something in the biotech space. I was getting an American accent from having lived in the US for so long, and that was sort of freaking me out. So I said, my Irish roots and my Irish loved ones were consistently taking the piss out of me, calling me names like Yank and so forth. So I said, okay, I need to get out of here. And um, and there's not a lot of biotech in Ireland. There's a lot more in the UK. Uh, but there's a sort of slightly dearth of entrepreneurial energy in the UK. I think it's changing, but that was the feeling I got at the time. So I thought, bring this US entrepreneurial zeal, ambition, big mm-hmm. scale, scaling mentality to what is a very richly, historically very rich, scientifically minded um place like the UK where you've got these amazing academic institutions with incredible legacies in the biotechnology. I mean, much of the sort of founding science of the biotech sector came out of the UK. They just haven't really, we haven't done as good a, as good of a job as the Americans in actually commercializing and taking those companies to the next level. And I wanted to help, I wanted to get into that early innovation ecosystem and try to catalyze some, some entrepreneurial endeavors here. Met my wonderful co-founder by the name of Quinn, who um, had been doing a lot of work in liver disease for his whole career, really. And he kind of broke down what he saw as the big challenges that were facing the liver disease field. And the big challenges he, he outlined were, look, the biology, like a lot of chronic diseases of aging, which liver disease and neurodegenerative disease, and a lot of these things really fall into that category. We still don't really understand the biology. It's a very complex problem. And in order to try and decode that problem, we wanted to employ a lot of these new technologies like single cell and spatial sequencing and advanced omics to really study um, and apply new computational techniques to really try and unpick and figure out what's actually going wrong with the disease. And that was the first big sort of problem we, we endeavored to solve. And the, and the second one, which I think we'll spend maybe a little bit of time talking about today, is that the models that we've used historically to try and solve liver disease, animal models, mice models, large animal models, they haven't really been very predictive of human disease. And this is sort of a phenomenon that the industry is now grappling with in that we, you know, all the NASH drugs, all the liver disease drugs that went into human testing have failed, but they all worked in a mouse at some point, right? So something's wrong mm-hmm. with the mouse. The, de- the definition of insanity is yeah. continuing to do that which you know is, uh, is incorrect. And so we tried to think about how would you redesign translational models if you were going to really endeavor to make an impact in this space. And the thesis we came up with is that human tissue-based models, as close to human beings as possible, maintaining that rich complexity of human disease in our preclinical testing is going to be necessary for us to really crack and have success in this complex area. And so we do everything from 
taking biopsies of diseased liver tissues and maintaining them to study our new medicines to actually keeping whole human livers that can't be used for transplantation because they're old or diseased or and wouldn't be suitable for a donor or for a recipient, I should say, and maintaining them on these devices outside the body and basically running this sort of clinical trial before the clinical trial to really give us conviction that our medicines are going to really be successful when, when we put them into, into a human testing setting. And then lastly, this kind of final innovation of the business is that clinical, and this is a bit more nuanced than for anyone in the drug development, I guess it's a health tech crowd, so probably get it, but Dr- clinical trials and clinical trial strategy is, is really key to success in the biopharmaceutical sector. And the challenge with p- big chronic diseases like liver disease is that you want to run uh, not like a fatty liver disease study, your endpoints are very messy and therefore you need these really large trials that are really long term to have statistical significance to demonstrate that your medicine actually works. And that just costs a lot of money and it's not very viable. It's difficult for, for a small biotech to take that on. So rather, we sort of tried to flip it on its head and say, what are the short-term, small clinical in the clinical trials or diseases that we can focus on to demonstrate that our medicines actually work? And once we see success there, think about trying to raise the money to go after the much bigger, much more ambitious clinical studies. And we've talk, we talked a lot about liver transplantation, about alcoholic hepatitis, but some of these sort of slightly um, more niche diseases than, than your more traditional fatty liver disease trials, which are which are a big, big theme in the pharma sector. And that was the idea. And that was four years ago. And we wrote it all down, wrote out the kind of cultural values the organization wanted to build, laid out the longer term strategy. And look, much of it's actually, I'm still saying the same thing. The pitch hasn't say, changed a whole lot. So um, so we must be on, <laughs> must be on to something. Uh, I mean, yeah, we're, we're kind of gearing up now to really make it real. We're heading into the, hopefully into the clinic next year, all going well. And really setting setting the company up now to to scale. It's it's been a really uh, I feel privileged to have been part of the journey of Okabar for the last four years, and I'm really excited for the impact we hope to have over the next the next four and beyond. So that really ramped up in terms of my ability to understand things from busking on the streets to uh, redesigning translational biotech models. So uh, I'm going to walk mainly myself, but our listeners through this. Um, <laughs> But I want to start. I want to start back with you, and I want to. I want to talk about. So, Oka, Oka Bio is a big, bold idea. It's a big, bold company with what you're doing, and I will get into this so that everyone will understand it. But with what you're doing, you're you're redefining quite a lot of stuff. You're doing things yeah. very differently, and your vision is enormous. And I think one thing that particularly health tech suffers from, biotech perhaps less, but still, I think UK entrepreneurs suffer from, you might see where I'm going with this, is the opposite to what you described as big scale energy. Now, that is a really interesting term that obviously you learned in the US, right? You got this scholarship to go over to the US. Um, You were learning about commercialization, which I think is a really important point as well, by the way, that actually you are not coming at this from a very early stage. You're not coming at this from, oh, wouldn't it be nice if this, wouldn't it be nice if that. You're learning very early on that money makes the world go round. And this is an uncomfortable conversation in healthcare. Like it really is. And actually I've had this with a few people now. I've had a couple of people from private equity backgrounds that have started health tech companies, but they hit different, the, the the companies that these sorts of people start, because their starting point is to analyze the money and where the money flows and to realize that value is attached to what, you know, if you can attach value to money or money to value, whichever way that you can analyze yeah. this. But ultimately, that's that those two things are inextricably linked and, and they 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 are attached to each other. And that understanding and that that level of comfort from people that are from finance who are indeed just know and understand commercialization, I've just I'm starting to see that the way they build companies is is hitting the ground running. Let's just say so. Mm. Rather than raising money to figure things out, they figured things out and then raised the money, putting it straight into a, a commercial system that they know works. I think that's super interesting. But I want to talk to you about those two things really. This big scale energy. And knowing the commercials and, and and learning to commercialize innovation before even becoming an entrepreneur, 
I want to talk about those two things. What was the US like? Uh, I mean, people do talk about this big, bold, like they do want the big vision and the big moonshots. And in the UK, we're far more polite and try and be more appropriate and realistic, et cetera. But I don't know. You, you're from Ireland. You've got, you've, you've got, you, you've not got the UK bias, perhaps. So <laughs> tell me how it is. UK versus US, becoming an entrepreneur. Yeah. Talk to me. Look, I, I really enjoyed my, my time in the US. I, I, I just thought it was so, such a fun work culture. I, I, I don't know how to, how to give you some good analogies for it, but, but maybe one of the, one of the, my first days on the job, um, in consulting, I just remember it really clearly because it was just such like a, it felt like such a movie scene where we had this big client meeting or whatever. And, and just, there's this war room set up behind the scenes. It was like something out of a, everyone's so amped, you know, the whole team is like ready to go. <laughs> Everything's been, it's like a coordinated effort to present this very slick presentation to whoever the client was at the time. I was never gone. This would never happen in Ireland. Like, you know, people would never be this psyched, this psyched for some, for some business meeting or some presentation. People would just turn up and be like, yeah, okay, we're going to do this. And yeah, we're going to do that. Okay. Sounds good. Let's go. Whereas in the U S it's like, it's just dry. It's, everyone is like in it. You know, everyone's thinking this is going to make my yeah. career. It's going to make my, we're going to go for gold here. And it's a collective like decision that we're all going to just give it all our time. <laughs> and we're going to work late. We're all going to be in there. We're all going to be kind of grinding through it and I, I know I, I don't know if that and everyone it's just kind of funny because it was like even people are wearing those like classic american sort of pinstripe suits and everything and i'm like what the <laughs> fuck am i in you know um but anyway i i just felt i guess the the differential was it that was just a that's just like an image that describes a culture that is just like a very i know this is so cliche to say but it is like ambitious it's like we're not here to we're, we're going to take this really seriously and we're going to really show up we're going to put our best foot forward and we're going to be really fun and collegiate or have a good time doing it and it's going to be it's going to be impactful and I, I think that maybe is representative of of the broader sort of cultural norms of u.s entrepreneurship and i think i think the uk is getting there as well and the, the other thing is like once you see success and you see how how much like how big these companies can get it just gives you you're like, wait a minute, they're just fucking humans. They're, I know those people, they're not that yeah. much smarter than me. I could do this, you know? And it just gives you this sense that if they can do it, why can't I do it? And like that, I think that's like a story of a lot of um, big entrepreneurial successes. Like even you think about in the U Europe, I know the Tavid and the the um, TransferWise guys a bit. And like they, their story is kind of similar. They went to Skype was the big success at Estonia, I think in the early 2000s. They were sort mm -hmm. of in the wings watching it and going, this guy's not that sweet. I could do this, you know? Like, and then that sort of energy, that confidence breeds out a new enterprise, like transfer wise. And then, and now those guys are seeding tons of companies. And Estonia is like this super entrepreneurial hub of like deck multi unicorns and decacorns. And it, and it is this sort of, I think it's, it's a culture. It's like a, it's a human psychology phenomenon that there's probably a bit of competitiveness in there. There's probably a bit of like a, um, uh, sort of infectiousness of entrepreneurship in there. And, and just the fun and the excitement of it is like very addictive. And I think when you, when you see some of that stuff catalyze, you, it begins to build, uh, build a lot of momentum. Of it. And I think we're at that point in the UK now where we have seen some pretty significant successes, both on the tech side and on the biotech and health tech side. Like Excientia is a great outcome. They're just across the road from us here. I meet with some of their team on a semi regular basis. Like, um, Kaimab was a big outcome. You know, there's been a few, there's been a few like decent sized success stories now. And those people, mm. that talent gets recycled in it. And it doesn't necessarily mean the CEO or the CBO or whoever gets recycled, but the guy who works for the, who works underneath the CBO and has been in all the room, in all the meetings, in all the deals and wants to take, have a go at it themselves. Those are the people that really kind of push the next wave of entrepreneurial companies. And, um, yeah, I, th I think I, I, I don't know if I answered your question or even, um, yeah, but that, you that's did, kind yeah. of, yeah. And I thoughts. think, there's, yeah, there's definitely something about belief, actually, and just seeing the evidence that, and then the relatability of, well, they're just like me. And then it breeds this sort of why not, uh, like mentality, I suppose. And I think in, in classic British culture, it, it's, it's not, it just doesn't seem, it doesn't seem as culturally relevant for us to be like, 
oh, I'm so ambitious. I want a billion dollar yeah. company. Like, but then there's this thing of like, why not? Like, but if you've seen the evidence and you were number two, number three, number four in that company, and you're very close to the founders, you've seen how they've operated. You, it then does breed this why not? And actually, it is then based on evidence. So it's not blind hope and optimism. It's actually evidence based logic, which actually you know makes complete sense. So I, I, I do get it. But obviously, right culturally. Yeah, our Britishness certainly gets in the way with a why rather than a why not. But I think that is good for early stage entrepreneurs or indeed anybody that, that is thinking about building a company. I think a healthy dose of both is appropriate because at the end of the day, when you're thinking about your vision and what you want to achieve and what you think this company could achieve, then why not go for the massive billion dollar company idea like again why not and especially then if you can get yourself connected into the top of certain organizations you can witness some of this stuff and see how it actually happens you can then put the dots together and it becomes like a real why not of like hey well if they can do it and i've got this idea then surely it can happen for me too so i i yeah i, I definitely it's just interesting to me because I, the, I think, the other thing i went to some talk one time and it just really hit hit home with me it was it was someone talking about if you're if you're going to go for it, fucking go for it. Like, go for the big fish. If you're, yeah. you're going to go fishing, go for the big fish. Like, if you're going to try and start a company and you're going to dedicate huge amounts of your time, energy, and life to it, at least make it like a company that's going to be remembered in the next century. You know, like, like you might as well really try and build a big company if you're going to build a company. I don't know. That, that, that was like part of the Do you thinking know what? for me. That, that, is some, that, that is actually something that I've been thinking about recently, which is if, if, if Somex was five times the size, there's still only 24 hours in a day. I'm, yeah. I'm only going to be working a certain percentage of those. And it's probably not a wildly different percentage of those to what I'm working now. It might actually be less. So like y you are doing the work. And so why not be thinking in larger? It's, it's like that classic sales thing, isn't it? Like if, you, if you're going to go into sales, sell the most expensive thing because your commission, <laughs> your, your fixed percentage of commission on a million dollar deal is far, is far more than on a, on a 10 pound. Do you know, it, it, yeah, it, it yeah. makes far more sense to just sell the most expensive thing. It's just all the same thing with, with the size company and your time. I mean, it depends what obviously the time goes into and things like that, but Hey, if you're a venture backed organization, you're looking to make a change in biotech, then why not try and aim for the, the star it's that aim for stars you might hit the moon type thing isn't it you know yeah i think about something that's really going to impact human human health in a very meaningful way like i, I think yeah. our focus on chronic liver disease it's such an unserved underserved massive yeah. public health challenge I, I mean that is a big ambitious like very inspiring and motivating yeah. thing to be thinking about all the time as you because i mean entrepreneurship you know this it's really brutal like it's very emotionally taxing oh. very stressful like that you do pay a pretty high price for it but and then you know the then having a very meaningful ultimate goal is is super rewarding uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. You need that reason to get out of bed. You need that reason exactly. to run through the brick walls because there's many of them to run through a day. And actually, the that purpose that sits behind it in health tech and biotech is uh, yeah, we're we're, we're lucky we're lucky to have it. So let's talk about Oka then. Um, and we've we've, okay. got, we've got a while, so we we can we can walk our way through this. I want to I want to go back to the idea stage actually of when you were thinking about this and and perhaps what that big vision was what the smaller goals were how you thought about commercializing it were you thinking about that from day one did you build the model first did you speak to quinn what what came first talk to me about the the, the early days of turning an idea into reality how'd you get from idea into something so the first thing we did was just map out the strategy, which which hasn't really changed a whole lot. I mean, it was this idea of yeah. better discovery, better models, clever clinical trial design. And then we thought about, okay, if that's the strategy we want to get to, it's a pretty ambitious strategy. We're innovating across multiple domains here, which makes life um, a little bit more taxing. What are the proof points we would need to show people to really give us to be able to secure the resources necessary to go and really give this a meaningful shot? And we sort of mapped it out in terms of Okay, to get to the first 250K or the first ticket, we would need, you know, we need a very clear narrative of what we're going to do with that. To get to a larger seed round of five to 10 million, well, we need some data and some evidence that there's some merit to this idea. So let's raise a little bit of capital. Let's go um, do some early proof of concept studies and then let's use that 
as evidence to catalyze a larger financing. And then you sort of hit the, the ball, starts rolling from there and things can really take off. Um, so, so, so that was a lot of what, what we did. I mean, we did accelerators, which are a great way to sort of help foster and help nurture an a, 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 um, embryonic business. We, we were fortunate enough to get into Y Combinator. That's a slightly funny story. We, we applied like two months late and, um, you know, I, <laughs> Uh, in, in classic, we got invited then uh, to go over an interview, and it was the last day of the interviews before the court. The court actually started that day. They took a couple of people to interview right before the court started, and we only took we largely took the interview because we got a free flight to California. We could go do sort of some meetings <laughs> at JP Morgan, not really thinking we had much of a shot in it. Because I thought I'd butcher. We did a, a two a.m. first round interview, and I was so tired, and I was and it was fifteen minutes. This YC thing is like hilarious, like fifteen minutes long. And I totally butchered it. And I was like, oh, fuck it. Okay, we, I, I, we're definitely not getting in. And then they were like, well, come out and meet us. And I was like, okay, if my 2 a.m. interview went that badly, uh, I, yeah, there's just no way we're going to be, this isn't going to work. But then I remember we got the interview, went down um, to get sushi and sort of commiserated uh, in a sushi parlor down in Palo Alto. And then we're about to get the train back up to the city and go and kind of we'll get ready for our flight home. And then we get this call saying, Turn around, guys! You're in for the next cohort. We so said they come back down the road. And it was like wow. a, it was super, and it, and it had started just that day. We're actually late for the inauguration of the program, which is quite a funny feeling. But anyway, I had such a fun time. That was that was such a good experience, um, and it, it's a really helpful sort of catalyst, particularly for two random guys. One guy from rural Ireland, <laughs> uh, one guy from South Africa, um, and like this sort of really novel idea which was like seemingly bizarre at the time to most to most folks this idea of keeping organs alive outside the body as a way to test out new medicine was like seen as proper sci-fi now a lot of the big pharma even roche just this week launched a human human biology institute to try and develop a better translational model so the idea is slightly less crazy than it was four years ago i think that's true of a lot of good ideas um but anyway it was just a it was very fun and that, that yc experience really helps you think about financing the company gets you in front of the right people sort of helps shape your narrative in a way that's attractive primarily to there is a definitely a different style of pitching to to us and, and european investors and kind of helps you hone that ambition that we were just talking about and make it mm. give you a narrative to support that sort of um that ambition but anyway uh that gives you a little bit of the, the background yeah definitely i've i've heard um I've heard a lot of things about that interview being brutal. I don't think anyone's come out of that and, and thought, oh, that was a, a walk in the park. I absolutely nailed it. So yeah, there's a, there's a few, people, few people I know that, in, uh, that got into YC that have had very, very, very similar stories to tell of thinking that they absolutely butchered it. Um, so yeah, it seems like they give everyone a hard time. I think so. I think so. It's just so short, you know, you're kind of in and you're out and you're like, what the fuck? Did that, was, that was it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. Um, fine. So... Oka itself, then you talked about discovery models and trials. Let's start. Let's start with discovery. So, what are you discovering, and how are you doing it? Great question. So, liver disease, as I mentioned, very complex. There's been a lot of folks who've tried and ultimately failed in developing new medicines. And the founding thesis behind our business is that we still haven't got a very good handle on the right biology, the right targets to, mm. to ultimately develop medicines to treat to in order to give us the best chance of success for liver disease patients. So what we do a lot of work in is single cell and spatial sequencing, large quantities of tissue, of diseased tissue samples, diseased and healthy across our three sites in Taiwan, the UK and New York to give us this really broad ranging data set related to liver disease progression and different sort of stages and different types of, of liver disease phenotypes. And from that, we can then mass all this rich genomic data and then start to interrogate it in different ways using various different computational techniques to try and say, is this particular gene upregulated at this particular stage of the disease? Does that a clue that that might be an interesting therapeutic target that if we developed an siRNA, which is a, a silencing RNA or an RNA that um, interferes with the expression of a particular gene and therefore can adjust um, that gene's impact on the disease? Would that be a therapeutically relevant, or that, would, would that be, have the potential to be a, a therapeutic? So we do a lot of those types of uh, in silico screens and coming up with new target hypotheses to really hopefully get us closer to the right biology for, for treating, for the right patient for treating, for treating the disease. And then that informs the type of mm. medicines we then make, if that makes sense. Yes. 
So staying on this discovery bit then, so the currency for you here is the data. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's you guys across your three sites that are collecting this data and then using computational techniques to find what might be the best targets. That's correct? Exactly right, exactly right. And then we can, it, we can very Fine. quickly test them in our human tissue-based models and really try and learn from that that um that research or that sort of wet lab validation and give that give us more precise clues as to where where to go next in terms in searching for mm. the right genes or the right targets uh, and that, it's that kind of yeah. ability to iterate in human biology with this very rich sort of data repository that we believe will ultimately get us to the best medicines for for treating this disease i understand so i just wonder then my first question on this is what's the what's the rate limiting factor here to the accumulation and the increasing of uh, of the size of your data set what limits you in that is it resource to purchase what you need in terms of the biology itself is it computational is it another like what's what's the step there that would stop you from just accumulating this data set incredibly quickly yeah, I, I don't think it's computational techniques. I actually think a lot of the algorithms for this type of work will ultimately be commoditized. I mean, it sort it sort of seems that way with the likes of ChatGPT um, and some of these large yeah. large models um, being very very seemingly amazingly um, able to write their own code and, and so forth to help us get to better models to interrogate this type of data. And we don't use particularly sophisticated computational techniques. A lot of it is down to the strength of the your actual good good data in good outcomes or good insights coming out, bad data, bad insights, and sort of waste, waste of time. So, so for us, it is really about the amalgamation of large sequencing and advanced omic um, data sets on, on the diseased tissue samples that will ultimately get us closer to better insights to, to treat the disease. And, and for that, it is, a cost, it is a cost problem because there's only so much you can do with the limited yeah. resources of a small biotech company. But you can be very clever. There's lots of clever techniques scientifically that you can employ to maximize your bang for buck and multiplex samples and so on and so on. Um, so we do a lot of that to really give us a very robust um, robust data set. And, and then the other thing is like you want to make sure quality, you've got high quality control on the sample processing. Like that's the thing that a lot of companies actually fall down is, uh, is in the sample processing piece itself. And we use sort of different tools like single nuclei sequencing which helps us get a bit more control over the the consistency of the samples in different geographies around the world uh, and we also do a lot of sort of basic data data qa as well just to make sure what we're seeing is mm. is reproducible and accurate um so there's a lot there's a lot that goes into it uh, and the other thing is being able to actually study human organs on devices and study changes transcriptomically across a period of time having i guess temporal ability to study disease um process and, and, and therapeutic interventions in a temporal sense on an organ or device is very unique and gives you a very rich mm -hmm. sort of fidelity of understanding understanding of the disease process and how to potentially treat it so there's there's a whole range of different sort of inputs that ultimately lead to what we believe to be a very high fidelity high quality um knowledge knowledge set got it so your computational techniques identify a gene now so there's something going on here. This gene might be useful. What next? Do you switch it on, switch it off, see what happens? If so, how do you do that? Talk to me about the next bit. So Sidney Brenner, who our company is named after, um, who founded the Stop Codons in Genetic Code, which he named Amber Umbert Ochre, and he passed away the year we, we founded the company and named named it in his honor. The One of his quotes is that progress in science is dependent on new tools, new techniques, and new ideas in that order. I might be butchering that quote, but I think that's right. <laughs> and the idea being, <laughs> if you don't have the right tools, you can't, you can't really make much progress. So, so one example to answer your question is, uh, do you turn it off, turn it up, these particular genes? We prioritize genes that we can turn down, primarily because the tool with which to turn genes down is a very mature tool and very easily... Um, Got it. It's very easy to actually design and manufacture, and that's Galnac siRNA drug modality. It's a modality that was pioneered. siRNA was founded in '98, I think, and pioneered by Al Nylum as a way to silence genes 
that could potentially be disease causing. And so we know this is a very robust therapeutic modality. We can actually attach a galnac sugar to it, which makes it incredibly liver specific. So we know when we get into human testing, we're going to have no major issues with delivery, which isn't true of, of other organs and other tissue types, like where, where LMPs and others have been slightly less specific. So for that reason, we use that tool and that technology to prioritize genes that when down-regulated have a therapeutic effect. And that helps sort of constrain the search space of genes that we look for. And as you described, with what we do next then is find that short list or those particular genes that seem to have correlation or potentially even some causal role in the disease process based on the, the types of data sets that we've amalgamated. And then we test it, right? It's all well and good having the most sophisticated algorithms and very um, elegant computational theories and how to mine mine your data. But the reality is you can spend all day, in a, you know, lecturing on computational techniques, but if it doesn't work, in a liver on a machine, it doesn't fucking work. So, so, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we don't, we try not to over intellectualize on the discovery side and try to just get into the lab, test it, see if it works, understand the mechanism. Do we really believe in the biology? And then move that quickly and uh, with drive into sort of IND enabling and towards the clinic for, for patients who ultimately, ultimately need it. And that, that I think is one of the nuances of, um, sort of computational drug discovery that people maybe, underappreciate and this is going to sound very obvious and silly but people underappreciate just the incredible complexity of biology we still so know so little like like we are still <laughs> barely scratching the surface because uh, we go back to sydney brenner because these tools that we have to try and study biology are st i mean they're getting increasingly sophisticated and they're like infinitely more sophisticated than they were 20 years ago but they're still pretty blunt instruments like even Today, mm -hmm. like pharma prioritizes the majority of the targets they look at, they look for genetic validation, right? They want to see, they know there's this, there's G, GSK put out this paper a while ago that if you choose a genetically validated target, it's twice as likely to be successful in the clinic than, than any target you just pick out of your, you know, pick out of academic literature. And that's great, but I mean, it's, you know, G, GWAS and genetics doesn't give you all of the nuance around the biology. It doesn't tell you what cell type that target is actually activated. It doesn't tell you at what stage in the disease process, particularly for chronic, you know, multi-decade diseases like liver and neurodegeneration. It doesn't tell you what stage it actually plays a role, when, you know, how, how is it upregulated or downregulated. It doesn't tell you a whole lot of a whole lot of that stuff that's key to actually developing an effective medicine. And yet that is the, the kind of gold standard of the industry to try and select what biology to go after, uh, which is a pretty blunt instrument, uh, in my view. Yes. Anyway, so, uh, some, some thoughts for you. And there. we're hearing so much about AI drug discovery, so much. Like mm. it, it's, it's, it's buzzy, isn't it, as a, as a term and entrepreneurs look for frontiers and entrepreneurs love tech and investors love tech because of the margins. And so all of a sudden, mm. AI drug discovery platforms become like a really interesting thing because they can be developed. The, 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 the money's great. The margins are great. The, the, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons why that is such an important step. I'm interested, though, because going back to what we talked about at the very beginning about big vision and, and big scale energy and commercialization here, what you guys are part of is the whole journey. And actually, the bit that we've just talked about just there is the is only the first part of that. There's actually a whole nother bit now that you've, again, you've scratched the surface on there about the identif identifying cell types and, and the role and stage and all this up, up down regulated. So you've got to create a medicine that reaches a patient now. You've identified yeah. a gene might work. Yeah. You've got to actually make a medicine that, 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 that does something to a patient because actually the exciting bit for tech entrepreneurs, fine, is the AI drug discovery. And we can talk about models and we can talk about computational techniques until we're blue in the face. But to your point, biotech is interesting because it leads to medicines that cure diseases that lead to humans having more life and more love and arts in their life. And actually that's yeah. the bit that, that gives this stuff purpose. And so I want to talk to you about that now. What's the journey from identifying, Hey, if we switch this gene off or turn it down, we can stop this disease. We can stop this cancer for me. We can stop this, whatever. Like what is the journey now to, to then creating a drug and how are you guys doing that 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 is the crux i mean that, that's such an insightful point um because it's not it's not it's pretty obvious but it's so overlooked by a lot of by a lot of people who, who enter the space really people who are sort of 
Uh, Which is why I'm asking, because I, I don't yeah. actually, like, I, I couldn't, I, I can piece together the knowledge if I really think about it, but I don't have a pithy answer for, like, okay, you've identified a gene, how do you make a medicine? Like, I, 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 don't act, I don't actually know the granular detail of that, if I'm being really honest with myself. Like, yeah, yeah okay, I could, bundle an, I could bundle an exam answer, maybe, in, like, second year <laughs> of med school if I needed to, but, like, about, like, phase something trials. <laughs> I, could, yeah. I could pick up a few marks, but, like... Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's not, we just don't talk about it. I don't no. know. And it's such an art. It's such a, it's such a nuanced and, and critical art to the success of medicine is all of the very minute, uh, intricate details of how you piece together a clinical strategy and how you optimize your, your financial inputs to your outputs and to all, there's so much thinking that needs to go into, uh, into the clinical development strategy of a new, of a new medicine. And as you said, the AI and the drug discovery piece is not really the currency of our industry per se. The currency of our industry is making medicines that improve lives and ultimately change the course of disease for, for those in need. That is, that is paramount to our success in the sector if we really want to be an ambitious and world-changing uh, enterprise. So the, the process from a development perspective is, right, okay, we, we've seen it, we found a gene, we've tested it, we consistently see it performs really well across different donor types, across different model conditions, and all those things you need to test, because stuff works in science, and it doesn't work when, the, you know, when it's, when you haven't sung the lullaby to the Petri dish, whatever. Right? So you've got to really cons- <laughs> look for consistency and coherence across, uh, across multiple model systems to give yourself anything to help the success, new. right? Literally anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to uh, enhance the success of the, the, the medicine. So once we do that, the next process is to actually design an SI RNA. Unfortunately for us as a RNA medicines company, that is actually a significantly faster process in our field of medicine than it is in a sort of a small molecule drug discovery setting because you have to do it through like years of optimization work and validation of a potential small molecule drug candidate whereas that's um slightly less the case particularly with galnec siRNA because the, the delivery technology has been solved and now you just any kind of you just need to match the right sequence to the particular gene of interest and it's a relatively I mean, it takes a few weeks but you you develop a whole host of sequences to address a particular gene. You screen them all in in various cell models, and you see which of those consistently performs the best. And you nominate, okay, this is our most promising sequence. Attach the Galnac. This is our drug candidate. So actually, all in post gene selection to drug candidate, probably a matter of weeks. Like, uh, whereas that is just not the case. Uh, a couple of months, maybe in the sh- sh- lower side, um, but that is not the the case for for small molecule drug discovery, where it would take multiple, a much much longer period to actually get to your final lead candidate. So then, once we've nominated the lead, uh, which we're at that sort of stage now, which is very exciting as the business because it is a very transitory phase, and this maybe ties into your question a little bit. Now comes this whole other massive question of how do you design your clinical trial, and not just your immediate clinical trial, right. but your clinical trial strategy that sequences your product through various stages, as you described, from phase one to phase two to phase three, potentially even across different disease settings, to give it the, me- the maximum chance of reaching market and having a reasonable reimbursement potential that would ultimately help finance the business and ensure that we can get funded to pick the product through that clinical development strategy. Um, so that that is a whole other complex science that we're just beginning to think about now. We hired in a VP of Translational Development is doing a fantastic job helping us really think through that and has done a lot in the liver and cardiometabolic disease space in the past. And the more I spend time with him, the more I realize, thank God we hired him because it's such a rich <laughs> and deeply complex complex art <laughs> to, figure, to figure this stuff out. Um, and yeah, and I think maybe just the last point I'll make is just on the culture of the organization. You think about that journey for a biotech business. You think about where you started, which was tech land and sort of sophisticated algorithm designs mm-hmm. or debates around how do you model this data to give us the right drug to then, okay, well now you're going to do the chemistry and the heavy lifting of actually designing the drug and you got to work with the clinicians to really think about how do we bring this through to patients in the way that's most efficient and ultimately leads to the highest probability of success for those, those in, in need of this medicine. There are such different worlds, right? There's such fundamentally different cultures along the way. You go from sort of artist to like operator, execution, yeah. You know, it's it's a really uh, different domain of expertise, and you got to try and harmonize all these very strong opinions and very strong personality types inside a house, inside a culture of an organization that is focused on what's 
important, and that is the patients, uh, not our own individual sort of ideas of what's important. You know, <laughs> like I'm trying to keep everyone focused on that. Yeah. Here, we're all here to move these medicines towards um, towards a really impactful ending, and we got to get over our own sort of ideas of what that means. It's got to be about the best outcome for for us collectively, and ultimately the people we help to serve collectively. And that can be a tricky a tricky thing to get right too. I mean, a lot of um, a lot of companies fall down on the people and the execution of the culture side. You can very, you know, you get a lot of smart people in the room, you all of a sudden have people rolling in different directions and kind of going off on their own tangents and that is just so incredibly uh, momentum destroying for, for a new enterprise. So that's something I spend a lot of time thinking about too and trying to get, trying to get right uh, across the business. That's really interesting. Um, one thing that came to mind when you were talking there about that whole journey actually, and you put it really nicely that it it starts with art and ends in science and how that pertains to all the different people that work in in your organization parts of all those different things and the requirement for the more logical operational side of things to make sure that practically things can work but then actually it also involves the people side and the emotions and making sure that those individuals feel purpose and fairly rewarded depending on who they are and what they want for their lives and how all of that needs to fit together is a word you keep using, which is culture. And, it, and you know, self-confessed, you think about that stuff a lot. It says to me one main thing that pulls all of that together, actually, that the true value is on the other side of so much complexity. And that's why this hasn't been done before. It's why the it, things are hard. And when things are hard, there is value the other side. The reason that, that there aren't a thousand companies exactly like you trying to do this in liver disease is, is because it's hard. And if it was easy, everyone would do it. it it's what we say at Smokes all the time. Like, if this was easy, everyone would do it and it would lose its value. And actually it's going to require a heck of a lot and is requiring a heck of a lot to bring all that together. And actually that really nicely leads me onto something that I wanted to ask you earlier, actually. You mentioned two things that I think relate to each other. One is that you wrote down, and I'll return to all the science, by the way, and I'll actually come back to that. This is a good opportunity for me to ask this. You wrote, you wrote down your cultural values at the start that you wanted to build the organization with. And currently, you are setting up to scale, in inverted commas. And I think part of setting up to scale is what you just talked about, hiring a very good person and then getting out of his way um, because they know something far more than you do. Exactly um, right. So that's definitely part of setting up to scale. But then, obviously, you're going to be hiring lots of people and bringing them in, and 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 there are these cultural values of the organization. I mean, can you talk to like the structure of Oka Bio for me? Um, talk to me about some of those cultural values and how that structure is set up to scale currently. So, when we started the company, before we'd even incorporated the business in 2019, we wrote out the three cultural laws or cultural values. So we, we defined these three laws, right? The first one was Clark's Law, which speaks to a little bit what we talked about earlier, which is any technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. And what we mean by that is we must strive for a really ambitious science, really not incremental innovation, really ambitious out there innovation, which I think, as you have rightly pointed out, is very much uh, evidenced by the, the thesis of the business as it's, as it's begun to mature. The second one, uh, familiar to an Irishman, is Murphy's Law, which is anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And by virtue of working at the kind of cutting edge of new new biology and, and, and new science, we're going to make a lot of mistakes. Things are not going to work out perfectly, and we've got to be able to brush our shoulders off and be resilient uh, along the way. And that is definitely a necessary trait of entrepreneurs. I think if nothing else, I have just a ton of fucking resilience. <laughs> just get battered mm. in the head all day mm. <laughs> and just keep going. <laughs> that, 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 that is probably my superpower. <laughs> like Homer Simpson. Uh, um, uh, and then the last one, the last one is um, Wheaton's Law, which is taken from Big Bang Theory and which is 
uh, don't be a dick. And that one, I think we might evolve as the company yeah. is a bit more corporate and mature. But basically, the intent there is we got to be kind. You know, life is so short and, and the mm. job is so hard. And there's going to be a lot of different failures and walls you got to run through. If you're not kind to each other, <laughs> it's not fun. It's not, it's not worth it. You know, it's, you're just not going to succeed ultimately because you need to build trust. You need to build sort of um, a culture that celebrates its successes. You need to bring, you need to build those, those things into the DNA of the enterprise or, um, or I think it's really, it's really can be quite terminal. So, so that, that is, um, those are the values that we set up when we started. And I think we've done a pretty good job of upholding them. Obviously, you, you, you know, things are tough and we, we mess up at times, but we get brush ourselves off and we try to stand by those and hold the, hold people to account to them to the extent that that is, um, that we can. That was the organization. And then the last, the second point I'll make just on your, your second comment is around organizational strategy. And, and I think this is actually perhaps one of the most underappreciated elements of successful businesses is trying to get the right people in the right seats at the right stage in the right oh. dynamic in order for them to be successful and ultimately for them to drive the company forward. And I, I think it's so, it, it is like three dimensional chess in a way, because, because you don't want to over egg mm. the pudding. Like, there's a real temptation to bring in a bunch of very senior executives right off the bat. But then particularly if you're a first time oh. CEO, you're kind of figuring it out as you go. Like you have to be to a degree. You have to figure out the you haven't done it before. So by definition you're figuring out the role as you evolve and as the company evolves. And in doing so, if you over egg yourself, you'll probably shoot yourself in the foot. So you gotta kind of build that senior leadership team at the right time in in the company and your own development. And they also don't want to bring in people who are used to running thousand person R and D organizations and then get them two people and a like one and one idea. Yeah. You, know, you gotta get the right person for the right stage. And I think getting that right mm. and not over egging it is really hard. Like we we did hire a couple of senior C C people early on and it was just wasn't enough for them to do to keep them entertained. And then you kinda create yeah. all this organizational havoc by changing changing things up and and yeah, so I think that's been a really interesting learning as the company has matured. It's trying to get the right people for the right stage. And some people are amazing when the company is all hands on deck and you want to just get shit done and just move and there's no, there's not a lot of process involved. And then those people mightn't enjoy it as much when it's a 50 person company mm. and you got to be very thoughtful about your internal communication strategy and your process. And, and that just doesn't, isn't where people want to be, you know, and some people scale and some people just want to go to another early stage company and build it there. And that's fine too, you know? Um, yeah. so, so it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting. Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. It's been an interesting learning for me, at least. I think what, what I have observed is that there are startup people, there are scale-up people, and there are yeah. corporate people. I, th- I, think, I think there are those three categories. And I think as you go through the journey of working at a few different places, you kind of learn that about yourself. And, or, or at least you'll have traits from one of those camps more than, more than any other. I mean, who doesn't love like a really nice salary that's guaranteed for a number of years and tenure? Of course, everyone wants that, but you might actually value the chaos and the ideas and your decisions turning into an outcome very quickly, which you obviously get in the, the earlier stage that you go and that sort of thing. It is, it is fascinating. And one that I think, I, I guess I'm interested, like, do, do you make those decisions on instinct or do you, do you have any kind of framework in order to try and make those decisions? Do you have like warning signs that are tangible that go off if, if people do certain things? I mean, how do, you, how do you actually manage that in terms of moving those chess pieces around in that 3D chess that you mentioned? I'm asking that really selfishly. Yeah. Like, no, I mean, I it's, some information it's a good question. It's a good question. I am... Um... I don't know that I have a great framework for it. And I don't even know that I have a great nose for it. I, th- I think you develop a nose with time, if I'm honest. Like, I think, I think I've learned a few yeah. hard lessons over the years where I probably should have pulled the plaster off sooner or maybe, maybe didn't yeah. quite let things fester a little bit longer than I should. And then you learn quite the hard way because it ultimately, it, or toxicity is very, can become very rampant in an organization if you let sort of you know, things sort of fester without addressing them pretty soon on. So I, I think the lesson I learned is like, just be extremely direct. Like I, I think, I think it's just be extremely transparent about your concern. You doesn't, it doesn't. You need to do it in an uncom- computational way or in a. Just like, hey, I'm having this feeling. Am I? Do you think that's a fair feeling, or am I just way off base here about this performance issue? Or and try to be like pretty candid with people because then it's just better for everyone. And if you can have a culture that's very candid, people know where they stand. And it's as as we as I just mentioned, it's not a big deal if someone isn't the right fit for the company or doesn't want to be in the company they're going to be happier out of the company. You're not doing them a favor by keeping them here. And they know that oftentimes they come to that realization themselves before you even, you know, if you, if you have an honest conversation with, with them. And I think, I think that also just creates this sense of a safe space for everyone. Once people know that, 
there's not a bunch of talking behind your back going on they they'd respect they know that you're going to respect them enough to be very direct with your feelings they know you're going to do it in a non-confrontational way and try to do those fairly and as kindly as you can irrespective of whether or not they're ideally suited to the business i mean life is long and it's not all about you gotta look after people and if you have a culture that looks after people yeah um people will recognize and feel comfortable in that and comfortable to tell you look i'm not enjoying the role look i'm sorry i want you to succeed i want to help you find the right person for the role but it's not me that's the best outcome for everyone oftentimes it doesn't always happen like that, obviously, but um, that that is what you should be, what we strive to, to for. You sound like a great leader, Jack. And actually, you know, it, it, radical candor or kind candor is what you're talking about there. It's, I suppose, the first few times that you do that is very difficult. But actually, when you see that it leads to good outcomes, it becomes a lot easier. It's something that we're definitely working on and definitely need to get better at. But I want to go back it's to, hard. I want to go back to the... Yeah. the the science though man like i want to talk, okay. i want to talk about uh, yeah it is it is hard <laughs> i want to get i want to go back to the science though um so the trials part testing so we've identified our gene we turned it down we've seen hey we can we can cure this disease if we turn this down we've attached it to some rna we've found uh, a nice yeah we we've, we've made a nice drug basically now we need to test it so what is done currently, and a loaded question, so I know you do something different here. What what are you guys doing in the testing phase? So typically, for most interventions, and this is, goes back to a necessary uh, regulation that was put in place around animal testing. Um, I think it was in the sixties, post the thalidomide sort of scandal, um, where every drug needs to go through a sort of regimented animal testing phase before it gets put into humans, and that's. That's very valuable for certain elements of drug testing, like safety. You want to make sure there's no major off-target safety concerns of a drug. For certain disease areas, like um, vaccines or sort of immunology, it's it, the, the systems between human immunology and an animal immunology is relatively similar. But for chronic diseases, like where it takes a long time for the disease to progress, and oftentimes there's an inherently human sort of component to it, they're not a good model for determining the efficacy of your medicine. Uh, animals aren't for, for chronic human disease. And for that reason, we tend to try and steer clear of them for determining the efficacy of our medicines. And we focus exclusively on human tissue-derived models, be they sort of basic cell models, or we take human hepatocytes from donors or human cellate cells and culture them and try to recapitulate many, many human livers be they actual slices of biopsies of fresh diseased liver tissue through our, our lab in Taiwan, or they actually discarded donor organs that cannot be used for transplant and would otherwise be going in the bin and actually repurposing a, a whole human, a diseased human liver, maintaining it ex vivo on a device in a quasi-organ ICU setting, and then using that as a model to study new therapeutic interventions in a in that complexity, that rich, complex, diseased human organ uh, as a way to give ourselves confidence that our drugs will ultimately work and the, all of the rich complexity that we as human beings have lived lives and have eaten X and have drank Y and have had this sort of, this particular lifestyle are in, inherently uh, going to have is, is what we believe going to really change the translational, the probability of translational success for for liver disease medicines. And that, that is a big founding thesis. We will, of course, do the requisite safety studies in animals. Um, that is that is necessary. Uh, but from an efficacy perspective, to see if our drugs will treat human disease, we think the best model is hu diseased humans. <laughs> Without the human, just the organ. <laughs> if that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, which conjures up a really interesting image of lots of livers being grown in sinks or large dishes connected to various things to keep them alive and and drugs being tested on them which is fascinating you, you can confirm or deny whether that's actually the case but well well it is i mean i, mean, I think i think that can i think this is probably the challenge with our work is that it is really sci-fi stuff and it's probably gonna it's yeah probably gonna spook people but but that that is the that is the reality and, and i and i think you know our you, you could envision a world where that becomes the future not in a bad way, in a positive way, because it's ultimately going to lead to better medicines for human disease that don't have all the side effects and don't have all of the, um, you know, ineffective. Most medicines barely work or work in a very small percentage of the population that they hope to treat. And by building these more 
human relevant mo- translational models, we think we will, we hope to really improve the success of the medicines we take into the, into the clinic. And the nat, the nature of that is actually maintaining many human livers, human liver slices, human organs that can't be used for transplantation in these, um, in these devices that, that, are, that are optimized to culture, culture such um, tissue samples, and then using it as a real, as a mini clinical trial. It's a preclinical clinical trial where you're testing a human, a new medicine in a human disease uh, and then seeing if it's actually effective. In the same way you would, that's why we call them organ ICUs because it is like a hospital ICU. We have transplant surgeons on staff right. and these guys are so passionate. It's like amazing to, to be in their company when they receive an organ, when they bench it, meaning they put it on the device, uh, when they think about the impact that organ is going to have for medicines for liver disease and uh, it's just the immense gratitude that's felt to the donor family for being kind enough to offer this for the future uh, yes. development of new medicines yes. for, for this complex and chronic condition, oftentimes that it may have contributed to their to their loved one's loss. It, it's a really, it's hard to articulate the profound impact and uh, of the work that we do, but ultimately the vision is very yeah, very clear with what we hope that we'll be able to, be able to achieve by doing so. So my question here, right, is what's the catch because of, of doing this and this move from animal testing to ex vivo organ testing, so growing organs outside the body and testing on them? So my question is what's the catch? And, and the context there is I think morally the right thing to do and what we're all happy with, uh, give or take whether you think an organ is conscious or not, is move away from an animal testing model to this model where you're testing on human livers grown outside the body, it increases the success of the medicine because uh, obviously you're te- by testing on humans, it's more real world, it's more likely to go to success through the trial, etc. Et so is the catch that this is a very expensive process more so than animal testing is there another catch because if it increases quality it increases the success of the medicine and therefore it's roi positive or business model positive or is that what we're figuring out right now you tell me yeah a couple things so the first is it is more expensive than animal testing it is it is we're running out an icu effectively for testing new medicines but as i just as i said and particularly in drug development where you're the more you can de-risk a new therapeutic product, you create this massive value for that potential for the potential product. So we think the economics right. make make sense. The question that we're demonstrating right now and will be demonstrating over the next few years as we begin to move our innovations into into the clinic is is it actually significantly more predictive than animals? That that is the the big question that our current uh, we're we're in the point of the of proving out now. Mm. And from a policy perspective, where where is this where is this going? Is this is this like it is this a wanted shift for various reasons and people wanting to move away from animal testing more broadly, or is this I, I don't know? Are there, are there big swings in in policy that are either enabling or or not this stuff? There are, there is massive. I mean, it, it really feels like an important time for for the field of human tissue derived preclinical models. In that the FDA just recently announced a pretty significant piece of legislation called the FDA Modernization Act, where they are trying to explicitly move away from animal testing or minimize the required animal testing right. for new new medicines and cosmetic products um, ahead of human human trials. Because at times, and I deal with because I talk to so many people in the regulatory strategy and clinical development space, at times the because a, a regulator, I mean. A regulator is doing a very important job for society, but they're also their incentives are slightly um, they're incentivized to not make a mistake, right? They don't want to be the person that's the one person who said, "Please go ahead and don't do the extra two animal." So, th- so they're they are inherently sort of biased towards just do the extra animal testing. Whereas at times that there's no real scientific merit to additional animal studies, uh, not always, but in certain use cases, and that bias is probably not helpful for the animal kingdom at large but there is a very it's sort of a balancing act right because there are there's definitely a necessary amount of toxicology work that needs to be done in animals but beyond that there there may be sort of overkill and unnecessary for for what you're trying to prove or de-risk scientifically so anyway so so the fda is trying to change that mindset and move towards a, a world where organoids and these new technologies that are beginning to demonstrate that they have a higher predictivity of human disease than the animals, particularly in certain use cases, 
uh, are being pushed as an alternative to animal testing, which is very exciting mm-hmm. for us because we've obviously built a company with the founding thesis that yeah, saves the, sort of save the animals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we, we've been in yeah. this for four years now, really sort of optimizing and trying to really get our heads around what, what, how much can we learn and what can we say as a result of the testing we're doing in human tissues and how much, um, what else do we need to do to, to supplement that? But can, can we actually really redefine what translational medicine looks like for, for some of these chronic yeah, conditions? And it feels like there is a, there is regulatory and society headwinds or tail, tailwinds, headwinds, head tailwinds <laughs> behind us to, to try and get that, that moving forward. But like all things in science, it only, it only takes one sort of uh, negative outcome to really set the field back. So it's absolutely imperative for, us and other leaders in the space to do absolutely everything to put patient safety first, but to incrementally um, move towards an alt- a, a new reality around what what preclinical drug testing looks like. Yeah, definitely great for you guys to be able to be the sort of standard bearers of that as well. Like I remember when we started Somex in in, in uh, during COVID and remote culture was just one of those things that we had to build, and then all of a sudden you become really good at it because that's all all your systems and processes, and you end up ahead. I think that sounds similar for you guys in in what is a far more noble um, field of of removing animal testing almost, and it is it is good to hear that that, that is the direction of travel. It's it's one of those things where like let's let's just hope that I mean it, surely the ROI is going to be there when when you look at these business models. Is anecdotally you must be looking at this going like yeah I mean all these animal studies and then you've got to do the human studies and then obviously the gap between animal study and human study is just it's just a lottery. Whereas actually if we get if we're qualifying earlier then actually you're reducing so much cost in all the ones that don't work and blah blah. blah. So it, it seems like anecdotally that this is a bit of common sense that the business model is obviously going to work for this and we're in a, it's a really nice thing that the morality and how good this feels actually sort of pulls in the same direction it is quite nice yeah i love the way you just articulated that i'm going to try and steal that for my future <laughs> pitches <laughs> but 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 one of the sort of you know there's this there's these standard metrics in pharma around probability of technical success at each stage of discovery from lead optimization early preclinical mm. work in vivo um phase one phase two phase three and it's so genericized, but you, like there are some examples where that's been fundamentally turned on its head. And one great example is a competitor that I might have mentioned who's an amazing company that we were incredibly inspired by, Al Nylum, who pioneered this siRNA, Galnac siRNA space. And if you look at the probability of success for their medicines, I think it's at somewhere like 40% through phase one. I have to pull up the graph. Yeah, right. But they have just this dramatically higher success rate than than norms across the industry because of the specificity and because of the technology that they use to develop new medicines. And you could imagine a similar scenario for us where because we're dramatically shifting the predictive power of our translational models to tell us what's going to happen in a clinical setting, we're just... like by an order potentially significantly altering the chance of success and then in in pharma and biotech it's all about that probability of technical success that drives your your empv or your net present value of your investment today in a particular product and if you can even marginally shift that you just create you can create significant value like alana was like a 25 billion dollar market cap with a relatively small number of commercial products because people now believe that this technology has a higher predictive power than the rest of the industry. And I think if we can demonstrate the same thing, all of a sudden we've created this much, this very rich, fertile ground of, of new medicines for, for chronic conditions. So I'm really excited. I'm really excited about the next couple of years, as you may have. have it sounds awesome, man. I, I guess my final question on, on Oka Bio before we wrap up is, whereabouts are you guys now? In everything that you've talked about, where are you now? What are you up to? Uh, when's the, cause you mentioned fundraising as a check, as, as your sort of checkpoints, I guess, earlier on in this conversation. Um, where, yeah, where are you guys at now with the company and when's your next raise? Yeah. So we are about to begin to nominate leads for heading into the clinic, which is a really meaningful moment for, for the business. And we're planning to do a large financing, kick off a large financing at the end of this year to move, move multiple products into the clinic over the next couple of years, which is, which is really exciting. One of our, uh, because we have this foundational sort of scientific thesis or platform, the vision is to raise a large enough round to take multiple products into the clinic simultaneously, a bit like what Moderna did when they first started out, to, to, to spread risk across multiple programs and really give our, our thesis the best mm. possible 
chance of success when we get into into the clinic, which is, yeah, it's going to be a really exciting next phase. And um, yeah, looking forward to to continue to stay in touch. And we're, we're going to be working together over that period. It's going to be fun. Hope so, man. Hope so. Um, listen, Jack, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, mate. I think what, what you guys are up to, it just sounds... Uh, it's got that big scale energy. Let's just say that it really does. <laughs> I think you guys, <laughs> you got <are> careful. <laughs> I, I, I just, I, I love what you guys do. You know, you know that we've been speaking for a while, and and I think the the more people that can marry that, um, marry the complexity of all of those different stages with the morality of the future way of doing things with testing. I think there's so much value to be captured at the other side of this. And for any entrepreneurs listening in health tech, biotech that are looking for a frontier and an opportunity, there is so much going on here that as we've talked about, we're only scratching the surface on the biology. You can argue we're only scratching the surface on the computational models, even at the minute that there's so much more that, can and will be done here across so many disease areas, across so many cell types that are causing so many diseases in so many different ways and pathophysiologies that there's just so much to target here. And I think you guys are doing incredible work, Jack. It wouldn't surprise me if you go far beyond the liver at some point. Um, and I, I honestly wish you all the uh, all the success in the world, mate. Um, for those people that want to get in touch with you, be those investors to get in touch with you towards the end of the year or indeed otherwise, what's the best way for people to get hold of you? Either probably LinkedIn or Twitter. I'm, I'm active on both of those platforms or shoot, shoot me an email at jackomara at okra-bio.com. Uh, always, always keen to talk to folks. Jack's a pleasure, mate. Thanks for coming on.